Okay, uh, that was the multiple choice. Let's now dive into the extended response. So here comes question five, part A. We begin with some geometry on the complex plane. Uh, triangle ABC is an equilateral triangle. So there it is there. Uh, it looks vaguely equilateral, not to scale. Uh, you've got points A and B, um, which represent the complex numbers, six plus four i and negative six minus four i. So let's go ahead and we can put that information onto our diagram. You've got six plus four i over here, and then you've got uh, negative six minus four i over here. Yeah, the scale's not amazing, but it'll, it'll do us fine, okay? Uh, find in Cartesian form, and you had to give geometric reasons, which is why this question attracts so many marks. Find in Cartesian form the complex num number represented by C down here, so this is my target, in the diagram. Okay, so how do I find this? Now, the first thing I'm going to say, and this was this is the first occasion to say it, um, but I'm, I'm going to state it now so I don't have to restate it every single time we encounter a question like this. The geometry um, throughout this paper was done very poorly. Now, it wasn't just because people looked at this and they were like, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to skip this, I'll come back to it later, I ran out of time. Um, it was incredible how many people tried to solve questions like this without drawing their own diagram. Now, I know you can uh, put information onto the diagram that's provided. Uh, that's fine. That's definitely better than um, not using a diagram at all. Um, but even looking at question papers and seeing that very little constructions were added, um, it, there was very little evidence that um, students were using the diagram effectively. Um, that was a big problem. And to be honest, with a question like this, uh, drawing a diagram yourself is often number one, the first step in understanding what's going on and therefore knowing what path you're going to take through your proof. Um, and number two, it's part of you communicating your answer. Um, if you have done all of your working on this diagram, which then subsequently is not submitted as part of your solution, then how do you expect a marker to be able to understand the line of reasoning that you've taken, the logic? Um, you know, at least in some of the proofs I'm about to show you, I had to add on, create new points or new intervals and things like that. And if you're just drawing stuff onto the diagram on the paper, or worse still, you just have like a diagram in your head that you're trying to reason through, the marker sees none of that. So you're not communicating your reasoning, which is kind of the point of this question, um, through your solutions. So that was um, something done consistently poorly throughout the task. Um, even when diagrams were drawn, they were very, very small. Um, and so it made it hard for you to know what was going on. And it also made it hard for you to communicate to the marker what you were trying to say off of your diagram. So. I'm not going to keep restating that, but um, this particular error comes up a lot. And it's not just an extension two problem. This happens in extension one and it happens in advanced. So please take major notice of the fact that geometry questions have to be done, uh, not just with much more care, but please think about how you are communicating visual information. Um, the best way to do it is visually. Draw me a good diagram. Okay, um, how do we work out a path through this question? I'm going to show you three different solutions for this uh, in increasing order of uh, messiness. Uh, you know, I, I actually uh, got help from other people to have a look at, you know, how would you solve this? Um, I'm going to tell you right now, the first solution I came up with was not particularly elegant, um, but often under exam conditions, that's the way that it is. You come up with a solution, you're like, maybe it's not the most beautiful one, um, but I'm going to show you there are better ways to solve this and why. So. Let's have a look at the first solution. Uh, I'm gonna say right from the outset, uh, it's not an intuitive solution for most people, um, but I'm showing it to you first because it's remarkably elegant. It's a really fantastic solution. Um, and even if you didn't think of it first, I want you to think of it in the future because the basic strategy that it uses is very clever um, and it often can make things easier. So let me get the question out of the way. Remember what we're trying to find is C. We know it's an equilateral triangle. We know where A is, we know where B is. How do we find C? The first solution approach is to introduce a translation. What does that mean? As you might be able to see from this diagram, which by the way, um, it also includes uh, the second part of the question, which we'll get to later. Um, the idea of translation is to slide around the points and intervals on our diagram to preserve directions and lengths, but to move them into a different position because sometimes a different position is just easier to work with. And you can see what this solution has done. It has moved one of our original points between A and B. You could have done either, would have been equivalent, but it's moved B um, from where it was, which was uh, 
negative six minus four i, it was over here in the third quadrant, and it has shifted it over to the origin. So now, you can see what I've labeled here is um, b, uh, a, C, and we eventually get to P. Um, I've placed them all um, in their new positions and I've given them a subscript of T to stand for translated. Um, so now this new version of B is on the origin, this new version of A, um, it's been shifted over to 12 plus 8i, um, and C has also been shifted as well. So once I find out where C is, to find the, the real C, not the translated C, I'm, I'm obviously gonna have to shift it back. Um, same deal for P as well. So once I do that, you can see over here in my working, um, and it's also critical that I don't just do this on the diagram and then hope that whoever's reading my um, uh, my working is going to say, "Oh, they must have you know translated things, right?" If I saw this diagram without any kind of verbal explanation of what was happening, I would just say. You have solved a different question. Like, this is not the, the question that I provided to you. So if you're gonna make some fundamental change like this, and it's just the same as if you're in some other question and you, know, you got presented with um, you know, something like uh, solve for x and you got given, uh, let's see here, uh, two to the x um, plus five lots of two to the x um, minus six equals zero, solve this equation for x, what would you do here? Well, you would, I hope, recognize that this is not a quadratic equation. Sorry, there should be, it's a bit cheeky of me, isn't it? That's what happens when I make up a question on the fly. There should be an extra two here. This is not a quadratic equation, but with a simple substitution, I can reduce this to a quadratic equation. Uh, what would I do here? I would want to get this into the form uh, u squared plus 5u uh, minus 6 equals 0 because I can use all the tools I know in quadratic e equations to solve this. But you wouldn't just write this because you have just fundamentally changed the question. Um, u squared plus 5u minus 6 equals 0 is substantially easier to solve. I have to show the connection between the question you gave me and the question I am now solving. Um, I would have to say let u equal 2 to the x because um, number one, communicates to the marker what I'm doing. Number two, it reminds me, I've just made this substitution. I'm gonna have to unsubstitute this at the end in order to uh, restore back the question I was supposed to solve, right? So it's the same deal here, right? In geometry, as, as in algebra, if you make some change, tell me what you're doing, right? Now, since all I've done is translated things around, I haven't changed uh, uh, proportions or lengths or anything like that. My new triangle ABC, or ATBTCT, which is a bit of a mouthful, that new triangle is also equilateral. You take an equilateral triangle and you shift it around, it's still equilateral. Um, so it's still equilateral. That means what I can do is I can say this um, BC, I'm going to stop using the, the T's because I think you can see it there. This BC can be found by rotating BA uh, clockwise by pi on three radians. So you can see here, this, this is the rotation that I'm doing. I'm thinking about taking, uh, this is probably going to be too thick, so let's just take it here. This is uh, BA, and when I rotate it pi on three uh, radians clockwise, you can see that's what brings me down to, let's use the right color, that's what brings me down to BC. Um, and of course I know that it's pi on three radians because each equilateral triangles, all of the angles are pi on three radians, so therefore um, I can write pi on three there. Okay. So, how do I do that? Um, how do you take a complex number, uh, or rather a vector, BC, that's represented by a complex number, and rotate it? Well, you take that complex number, 12 plus 8i, and in, um, we know in complex arithmetic, the way that you um, achieve rotation is by multiplication of the appropriate number, right? So you can see here, I've chosen this number, uh, I'll highlight it, um, cause, actually I'm using the wrong color because I should use the color that I highlighted before. I'm doing this cause of negative pi on three plus i sine negative pi on three. Um, cause of negative pi on three plus i sine negative pi on three is a complex number. It has a modulus of one. Um, I want a modulus of one because when I multiply, I don't want this, um, I don't want this ba to get any longer or shorter. So I want its magnitude, its modulus to stay the same. So uh, it, this modulus here is one, but then its argument is negative pi on three. If I were to put pi on three there, I would rotate pi on three radians anti-clockwise because that's how I measure angles. That's the default direction for measuring angles on the complex plane. I want to go clockwise, not anti-clockwise. So that's why you can see um, I've got negative pi on three as the arguments that are in there, okay?
Now, um, even though I write this to make clear, like that's how I do this geometric transformation, um, I don't want to keep in polar form. I don't want to keep in trigonometric form because um, it makes the multiplication hard and messy, right? I, I need to work out what is cos of negative pi on 3. It's a half. Um, what is uh, I sine of negative pi on 3? It's going to be negative uh, root 3 on 2 times i. So I've just changed that into rectangular form because then I can multiply through. Uh, I notice uh, on this line here, I've got a common factor of a half um, on this right hand complex number. So you can see what I'm doing is uh, I'm multiplying this by a half because they're all even numbers anyway. Um, I've got this, um, then I'm expanding out. So you can see this is me, this is me multiplying by one. And this is me multiplying by negative root three i. So uh, you can see I've got the i there, which comes from uh, uh, six times negative root three i, and then I've got an i squared because you've got to watch out um, for those terms there. Uh, and then what have I done? Uh, you can see here, just be careful, um, this negative four root three i squared, um, it comes down over here because that i squared or rather that negative i squared becomes a positive one. So that's where I get this term. Um, you can see where I've got this, um, this six just slides down into this six. Um, and then lastly, uh, let's see if I can fit it in here. This, uh, in fact, I don't really need to write anything um, too complicated, draw lots of arrows. This four i uh, minus six root three i, all I needed to do was just factor out um, this i um, over here. And that leaves me with four minus six root three. So what has this achieved? Well, I found where C is in this um, translated scheme. I remember I moved everything six units to the right and four units up. So therefore, having done that and solved where C is in this translated scheme, um, I have to undo that translation. So I added six plus four i to everything. So now I'm undoing that. I'm, I subtract six plus four i, uh, and that gives me this, which very conveniently, it's almost like it was designed to do this, um, gets rid of that six and that four i you can see there. So this is my answer for part C. Uh, sorry, for point C rather. Now, um, I know lots of you will say, who on earth would think to just take the diagram and just change everything, like move everything to different spots? Um, I certainly would have think, wouldn't think of that. Well, two things. Number one, I hope in the future, you now will contemplate this as a potential option. Moving things onto the origin is a classic example of um, taking a problem and simplifying some part of it so that it becomes easier to solve and then taking the lessons you learn from that simpler problem and then applying them to your original, more complicated problem. Mathematicians use this all the time. It's a fantastic technique. But totally solvable without thinking of this amazing, um, unusual insight. I've got two more solutions. One which is uh, pretty pretty good, I think, and I, th I know that a few of you attempted this. Um, and then one which is a bit of a mess, but it works anyway, uh, and it just shows you the flexibility that you have in solving this. So let's have a look at method two, which is to use some right angled triangle trigonometry. So you can see what I've got here is uh, my original diagram, A where it was, B where it was, and C where it needs to be. And um, what I notice is if I do this construction in here, I take this point here, the origin, and I join an interval over here to C, what I've done is I've divided up my equilateral triangle into two congruent halves. Um, I've got AOC over here, and this is congruent to BOC over here. Um, and you know this is extension two, so um, it's we're pretty fine for you not to do the entire proof um, of why these are congruent triangles, but it's not hard to see, right? Um, these two intervals here, um, AO and BO, are going to be equal to each other because of the coordinates of A and B. OC is going to be a common side, and then because ABC is equilateral, I've got BC being equal to AC, which are those outside uh, lengths. So I've got two congruent triangles. What does that enable me to do? It shows me that AOC has to be equal to BOC. And because these are angles on a straight line, they add up to pi radians. Um, that's what I've got right here. And because I'm just splitting this into two angles, um, they're each gonna be pi on two. So this is a right angle triangle and that enables me to do some right angle triangle trig. Once you've done that, um, you can notice that you've got this pi on three, just like we noticed before. It's just I'm now looking at a different angle. Um, so that's pi on three. That's my pi on two. There's a pi on six down here, which we don't really need. I can say, hold up, 
since this is pi on three over here, and I know what this length uh, AO is equal to, um, I can relate that to OC, this length, by using the appropriate trigonometric ratio. I can say, hold on a second, um, in relation to angle CAO, this pi on three, right? I've got um, OC being the opposite side over here, and I've got, let's choose a different color, um, I've got AO being my adjacent side. So what is the appropriate ratio here? You might have seen when I scroll down, it's gonna be tan, right? So you can see I've written here, in this right angle triangle, um, tan of pi on three, which is my corner angle, is opposite on adjacent, OC on OA. And you can notice here, I'm using the appropriate um, language here to say, a notation rather, um, it's not OC the vector, it's the magnitude of OC. Um, tan doesn't care about, uh, this is a ratio of lengths, not a ratio of vectors with direction, right? Because uh, these are going in very different directions and that doesn't matter to me, okay? Um, very, very minor note for those of you who were doing this, um, some of you jumped into just saying tan pi on three, it just equals this, or you know, um, tan pi on six if you use the corner angle. Um, it is really helpful, it's really clear. If you can say to me, well, hold on a second, why would I even say tan of pi on three? And the answer is, I'm in a right angle triangle, which I reasoned up above, and that's why I can say this, okay? So um, that just makes your, it's, is it necessary? No, but it makes your reasoning much easier to actually follow, um, and that can often make the difference. Um, sometimes it is just really difficult to know, what were you talking about? What were you reaching for? Um, where does your logic um, flow? So once you've got that, I know what tan pi on three is because that's an exact angle, um, an exact value I should say, so that's root three. Um, so I've got this ratio equals root three. I multiply uh, this length over here, OA, um, over to the other side because what I'm trying to find is OC. And the thing is, um, I know that uh, I can work out uh, what uh, that is going to be equal to by saying, hold on a second, AOC is this right angle triangle here, right? So therefore I can say um, OC is going to be uh, root three, because that's its magnitude, multiplied by negative I, that rotates me um, pi on two radians in the uh, uh, clockwise direction. And then um, OA, um, I multiply by that because it's essentially taking this, right, and lengthening it root three over here, you see that's the, that's the ratio, right? This length OC is root three times longer than OA. So I don't even know, need to know how long OA is, I just need to know that OC is root three times longer than it, and that's gonna give me, it's gonna stretch out OA and send it in the correct direction. So uh, that's going to give me uh, this arithmetic here, so the root three and the negative uh, I uh, are here, there's OA, it's by definition 6 plus 4I, I've just multiplied through and then I've just tied it up and you can see I get the same answer that I got in method 1. So as mentioned several people uh, gave this a go and I think it was a pretty good solution but many of you didn't even get to here partly because you didn't draw a diagram yourself um, and so you couldn't reason through what can I add to this diagram that will help me. Okay, um, I'm gonna show you a third and final method now. Um, it's, it's rather long and messy, uh, but I, I actually kinda like it because it just shows you um, how many different approaches you can take to these geometry questions, and uh, that's one of the, the wonderful things that mathematical thinking equips us to do, show us multiple solution paths to a single problem. So, um, I call this by midpoints. What am I doing here? Well, in order to get to um, point C, um, we could use right angle triangle trig like we did before, or we could use kind of the existing vectors that we have in order to reason through this. Now, um, you can, I, I will float through this, the working of it, um, you know, so that you can read it in your own length. You can just pause the video and read it and you can see exactly how um, I set it out. But let me just show you how it works on the diagram itself. How do I get to C by use of some midpoints? Okay, well I notice that O is the midpoint of AB, right? So if I have a think about OA, it is a vector from uh, the midpoint to one of the vertices, in this case from O to A. Now what I can do is I can take that and if I, uh, tr uh, not translate, if I rotate that by pi on three radians, uh, if I do uh, this, this clockwise rotation that you've seen me already do once before, that gives me this, and by use of some circle, um, not circle, some triangle uh, geometry properties, I can say this is actually going to take me, it's gonna create this little um, 
equilateral triangle up here, this is going to be the midpoint of AC. And that's really helpful to me because I can use that fact um, in order to take this, this OM vector, which I get by multiplying through um, by that cos negative pi on 3 plus I sine negative pi on 3 that you saw before. That's going to give me OM, and what you can see, I hope, is that, um, and it's easy to reason this, and you'll see this in my written form here, um, OM, that displacement vector is going to be, uh, it's actually a position vector, but every position vector is also a displacement vector. Um, it's going to be the same as the position vector BQ. And because it's to the midpoint, it's also going to be identical to the um, displacement vector of QC. So once I work out OM, all I need to do is then add that vector twice to B, uh, or I should say OB, because what that will do is it will take you from O to B, then it will take you from B to Q, and then from Q to C, which is what I actually want. So when you have a look at the working, uh, this is the part where I'm working out M, so it's because you can see I'm multiplying through to get um, the vector OM. It does end up a bit of a mess, but that's fine, it does actually simplify out. That's how you find M, and then once I do that, I say, okay, well, let's um, go to B and then do this OM vector twice. That's going to take you over to C. So you can follow this arithmetic yourself. Um, and since OC is a position vector, once you find this position vector, C is just given by that point. 4 root 3 minus 6 root 3 I, and you're done. So uh, that is three different ways to have a go at um, part one. Uh, if we come back to the question paper just briefly, you can see where we have to go from there is then to say, well, once you know where um, C is, um, imagine there is some point P that represents the complex number uh, little p that's positioned to make a rhombus, right? And they tell you that p is between, its argument is between negative pi um, and negative pi on 2. So where is that? Um, you can see that's going to put you in the fourth quadrant because here would be an argument of negative pi on 2, here would be an argument of negative pi. So I'm going to be somewhere down here. That's, you know, I've just shaded in purple all of the points that have this range for the argument. So the reason why this has to be specified is because uh, P could otherwise be in other locations. You know, you could put P over here or over here. Um, I want um, that position, that point P to be down here, which is why if I just come back to my diagrams over here, uh, let's just have a look at one of them. Um, you can see I've drawn P over here. How did I get to that? Well, once you've got position C, or point C rather, um, if you know AB, to, to make this a rhombus, uh, vector AB is going to be identical uh, as a displacement vector to CP. That's really easy to work out though. It's negative 12 minus 8i as I've written here. I've got to go to the left 12 units and then I've got to go down 8 units. So this is the appropriate vector. I just need to apply that to point C. I need to add those together because that will take me from O to C and then from C to P. So if you have a look at my working uh, down here, uh, this is me saying, look, the opposite sides of the rhombus are equal and parallel. They're equal, which means the magnitude of the vectors is the same. They're parallel, which means the direction of the vectors is the same. So that's what makes vectors equal to each other. And then I can say by addition of vectors to get to P, go to C first, then go from C to P, Going from C to P is the same as going from A to B, and then off you go, you get this result down here. Slightly messy, but that's the answer.